Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Charles Whitaker, and I'd like to welcome you to the presentation of the James Foley Medal for Courage in Journalism. The Foley Medal is one of the Medill's highest honors, named for a truly courageous alumnus who we lost much too soon. The award is our way of honoring not only James Foley's legacy of heroic journalistic endeavor, but it's also an effort to highlight the amazing work that journalists around the world are doing to shine a light on issues that should be of great concern to all of us. It recognizes journalism that exemplifies not just repertorial enterprise, but a dedication to storytelling that ferrets out truth and highlights injustice, even in the face of the most difficult conditions and circumstances. We're very pleased to present this year's medal to three intrepid AP reporters for their five-part story, Erasing Mariupol, which chronicles in harrowing detail the attacks by Russia on innocent Ukrainian civilians during the early stages of the Russia-Ukraine war. As the only international media remaining in the country, these journalists risk their lives to tell the stories of children as young as 18 months old buried in trenches. They also chronicled their narrow escape out of the country after learning that Russian forces were hunting them down. It is really compelling work, and I look forward to hearing more about its genesis and its execution. But before we hear from the honorees and about the making of their accounts, allow us to take a moment to show you a brief video that'll tell you more about the Foley Medal and the alum for whom it's named. The James Foley Medill Medal for Courage in Journalism is given to a journalist or team who best display moral, ethical, or physical courage in pursuit of a story. These journalists may be reporting on issues locally, nationally, or internationally. The James Foley Medal is designed to highlight all sorts of industrious and intrepid journalism. Journalism that shines a light on injustice and corruption, on inequality, and that really showcases those journalists who are doing this bold and brave work. I don't think we often do enough to showcase the kind of work industrious work that journalists are doing to ferret out truth. The award was first given by Medill in 2003 after being established by Medill's Board of Advisors. In 2014, the name of the award was updated to honor Medill alumnus James Foley. Throughout his journalism career, Foley exhibited courage while reporting from some of the most dangerous areas in the world. In 2012, Foley was captured while reporting in Syria. He was killed by ISIS extremists in 2014. I know as he matured as a journalist that he began to realize that the most essential type of courage for journalists was a moral courage. To dare to dig for the truth and pursue the truth even if it had negative consequences for his own career, politically or otherwise. He really aspired to be a man of moral courage. Throughout the years, Medill has been honored to recognize some of the most important stories of our time and the brave reporters, photographers, producers, and editors who have told them. Whether they're printed, posted, or broadcast, these stories have enlightened us to see some of the world's most significant news. I guess as a mother, um, the Foley Medill Medal is just an incredible legacy because how Jim would would want to challenge and inspire other journalists um, to be the best they can be, to be the best journalists because our world needs to know the truth and needs powerful stories. I'd now like to turn the proceedings over to my colleague, Professor Emerita Ellen Shearer. Ellen led Medill's politics, policy, and foreign affairs specialization for more than 20 years out of our DC Bureau. She's also one of the judges of the Foley Medal Selection Committee. She'll serve as our moderator this afternoon. Ellen, the virtual floor is yours. Thank you, Charles. 
And thanks to all of you who are joining us today uh, to learn more about the courageous journalism of our award winners and to uh, help us celebrate the legacy of James Foley. Um, Jim was a student of mine in the Washington program in fall of 2007, so I'm especially honored to be part of today's discussion. The winners of the uh, 2022 James Foley Medal uh, in Courage uh, are three journalists who risked risked their lives again and again in Ukraine to save thousands, thousands of others as the last remaining international media in the port city of Mariupol during the siege by Russia that started in February of 2022 and lasted through late May of 2022. We are going to talk about their reporting today for which they also have been honored by the Pulitzer uh, Prize and numerous other awards. Uh, but I can tell you that their moral courage in making the decision to stay reminded me so much of Jim's courage as a conflict journalist. So let me introduce you to our Foley Medill Medal winners. Mrs. Slav. Chernov is a video journalist at the Associated Press and president of the Ukrainian Association of Professional Photographers. He joined the AP in 2014. Before documenting Russia's invasion of Ukraine, he covered uh, major conflicts, social issues, and environmental crises across Europe, Asia, and the Middle East. He was named the 2016 uh, camera Operator of the Year and 2015 Young Talent of the Year by the UK's Royal Television Society. He's from Eastern Ukraine and is based in Germany. Evgeny Maloletka is a Ukrainian AP photographer who started his career in 2009 as a staff photographer for local Ukrainian news agencies. He went on to cover the 2014 Ukrainian revolution and conflicts in Crimea and Eastern Ukraine. His work has been published and uh, aired in Time, the New York Times, the Washington Post, CNN, and others. He's from Eastern Ukraine and is based in Kyiv. Vasilisa Stepanenko is an AP video journalist from the eastern city of Kharkiv. She graduated uh, from the Kharkiv State Academy of Culture. She worked for the Kharkiv Post and uh, local television uh, stations. She has worked with Ms. Stav and Yevgeny since before the war began when she realized that it would be crucial and more difficult than ever to provide accurate information from Eastern Ukraine. So the three started in Kharkiv and moved on to Mariupol when they realized it would be key to the war. They arrived hours before the first rockets landed and stayed in the city for nearly three weeks. As Russian forces closed in, they were publishing images almost daily, despite constant shelling and bombing. Their work became such a flashpoint that Russian uh, troops started hunting them down with names on a list. Residents begged them for advice on where to go, what to do, and, and many, many people pleaded for news from outside Mariupol. Despite the constant danger, the team made the decision to keep filming, keep shooting, and then to put the cameras down and help as best they could. Their AP reporting and Instagram feeds became lifelines and the team's knowledge of Mariupol's bomb shelters helped direct people to safety. They reported on Russian bombing of maternity wards and their, their stories were heartbreaking. And the immense suffering and deaths of civilians, including so many children, they left after a squad of Ukrainian soldiers arrived to extract them from the hospital where they were staying. They decided to leave because of the warnings that if the Russians caught them, they might be forced to say their stories weren't true. When they did finally escape, Vasilisa smuggled through a tampon embedded with a tiny 
uh, data card that had exclusive footage from a Ukrainian medic who was captured by Russia days after entrusting the team with her footage. The vi video showed that she was caring for Russian soldiers as well as Ukrainians and uh, treating children and others who were dying of wounds inflicted by the Russian forces. She said, the medic said um, that the stories that the AP put out using her video were instrumental in getting Russia to release her. So as you can see, uh, these three journalists did indeed show their moral courage in their reporting. So I would like to start out by asking all of you, what went through your decision? What went through your minds in your decision to stay? Did you, you know, were you thinking you you had any expectation of how bad it was going to get? If Jenny, maybe you could start. Hi everyone, thank you for this honor to be uh, the winner and uh, as a part of the team. And uh, this is uh, really in inspiring, you know, and uh, because uh, for us to be as a part uh, of the winners, you know, and uh, this is so important. And um, I can say that, you know, the decision and uh, itself for, for us on Bill was not discussing, you know, because me personally uh, grew up in Berdansk, uh, it's a city near Mariupol, and uh, the area which is actually like mostly my motherland, and the city where I was spent so many time during these uh, since 2014 and 2022, you know, pass me through, you know, like all these streets, uh, some hospitals, etc. And this is the area. Uh, where I've been, you know, been a lot of times, you know, and where I meet other doctors, uh, other businesses and families uh, working at the front lines and uh, based in Mariupol. So it was, you know, like so important at that time to be there and to see what what is happening and how the Russia was, you know, like, trying to burn the city without any reason, you know, shelling residential neighborhoods, uh, shelling, uh, using all the type of the weapons. And uh, we thought that it was so important to stay and uh, to document these war crimes against Ukrainians. And uh, and our team, you know, like was focused, like being, were together, you know, like and uh, make this decision together to stay and uh, to show the world what is going on. Because otherwise, if no one will show this, uh, there will be no evidences. Right, right. And uh, Mrs. Slav, what is kind of same question to you? Was there any a point where you said? this is crazy, we need to leave? Or did, you know, how did you cope with the danger that you must have been experiencing? Shellings every day. Um, I just wonder how, you know, how how did you keep yourself going? I remember, I remember the evening before, before the full-scale invasion, we were in Bakhmut, in the place which, in the city, which also is completely destroyed and Back then, we we understood that the invasion is going to start like tomorrow, and uh, just seeing where Mariupol is positioned, uh, it's strategically important for Russia. Uh, they they wanted revenge for 2014 when they were kicked out from there when they tried to occupy in 2014. So all of that pointed out that it's going to be, however the However, the invasion unfolds, Mariupol is going to be a target. We we knew, as Evgeny said, we knew that we need to 
to tell its story because it was so greatly important. Uh, and uh, it's not the first city they've been besieged by Russia, and and it's not the first city that they are attacking. They did they did it with Grozny, they did it with Aleppo. I've seen what they did with Aleppo, and while we were driving to Mariupol. We did expect that it might be surrounded. We did expect that it might be bombed. We did not expect it's going to be so quick and so devastating. We, this was probably for every one of us was the most dangerous and most complicated morally and, and, and physically or hard experience in our lives. But since then, many things happened, but many terrible things happened. But But Mariupol definitely was by far the most difficult one. But again, when you're there, when you're hiding in the basement, when you sleep with the patients of the hospital, when you when you sleep in the basement uh, of the hotel or you know elsewhere, wherever it is slightly safer to sleep, and then you see the doctors, then you see firefighters, police just getting up and just go and do their jobs without questioning, without just just doing their jobs. How can you just can you, how can you sit there? How how can you not do what you do? And for journalists, it's slightly harder because we don't really see the we don't really see the effect of our work immediately. Mm -hmm. uh, but but it was still was necessary because so many people told us you you have to record this, you have to tell the world what is happening. And again, we were so frustrated; it's not really changing anything at that point. Uh, and only later we understood that that those photos, those videos, were used to negotiate the Green Corridor that saved people. And that's actually like if that was the only thing that ha that happened because we did our work. That's already a lot. So if like one life is saved because of our work, we that's all we need to to justify all the efforts. Although it seemed that a lot more uh, resulted from your work. Um, so uh, you know, even more to uh, to stress why it was so important that you did stay there. Um, and you mentioned the fact that the city was literally besieged there was it was a siege situation which i think you know it it's hard to ima imagine no humanitarian aid coming in nothing coming in constant shelling um vasilisa i guess i i'd ask you the same question how did you all cover that i mean it was it, it was so dangerous how did you navigate when you could come out of the shelters um how how did you kind of figure out when when it was safe to be outside reporting? Safe ish, I guess. <laughs> yeah, it was uh, like real hell. In like first days, we only can heard some shell in the outskirts of the city, and then it become closer, closer, closer. While like they did start bombing everything like around us. So we changed our places all the time, trying to survive and uh, to do, continue doing our work. We uh, stayed in apartments and we moved to the hotel where we were basement and generator. <laughs> then we lived in a um, hospital for a week where uh, we documented the work of the doctors. And uh, there were also generators that we could use for charging our cameras. Uh, we also were in uh, ambulance department and police department. So like everyone really helped us to uh, do our work. And uh, so we try, we just continue doing it all the time. And uh, sometimes the situation, um, situations were really hard. Like uh, I remember the bombing of maternity hospital where we, we just, we were near the residential buildings in just uh, like residential neighborhoods. And we heard the airplane trying to um, hide. And then we heard this uh, airstrike, this bombing. It was so scary, like, because we didn't know maybe it will hit us but they hit the maternity hospital. 
And all the time it was like this. So we tried to move all the time to survive and to, but also to see what's going on in the city because uh, what we showed, it was just a percent of what happened uh, mm-hmm. because uh, we didn't, we we can't move all the time all, all neighborhoods in the city. So it was really complicated, but we tried to do everything to, uh, continue doing our work and um, continue being with the people, give them them, them voices and uh, like be together as a team, of course. Um, I just wanted to remind uh, those of us uh, in the audience, those of you in the audience, that you may uh, submit questions. Uh, there's a, a Q&A button that you should be able to send questions in. Uh, but meanwhile, I wanted to just you know, having read and and watched and and looked at all of your work, uh, um, you know, the you know telling the story of the the women being evacuated from the maternity ward was certainly one of the most heart wrenching, and then the the story about the mass graves uh, and that were many many children in those graves. Um, how did you know? How did you get through each day? At the end of the day, after reporting on something like that, uh, it, it must have been difficult for, to understate it personally. How did you, when you saw those images, and later on, how did you process that, Mr. Slav? Would you want to maybe open? So. It is, as I said, the most difficult experience in life we I had so far, and I think the whole team uh, agrees with me. But you know, when when you made a decision, when you made a decision once, then you just try to stick to it as as long as you can. And we are, as journalists, have a privilege of being able to actually make a decision to do this work. People whose stories we are trying to tell, they didn't have a choice. They didn't have a, a, a say in this. Um, the main question I think that persisted everywhere we went, the question that mothers have been asking, I don't know, God, when they lost, when they were losing their children, the, the question is why? And that's, I think, the most traumatizing and difficult Mm-hmm. of of all to to suffer and not even know why this is happening to you why uh, the neighboring country does this to your city or to your family so for us the why is clear we wanted to tell stories of these people about this about their suffering about their loss about their resilience uh and um and so it was it wasn't easy, but that part was was easier because it was our choice and there was a reason for this. And still, we are doing this work in Ukraine all the time. Um, we we spend all the time we we have and we we can there on the front lines there to try to tell stories of civilians and, and soldiers. Um, and uh, it's it's just our choice. We, we, there is meaning. There is meaning to that for us as journalists, but also as the Ukrainian citizens. Mm-hmm. I I can add that um, in the end of the day, uh, it's uh, it's hard to realize what you see. It's truth. What you see, it's real. Uh, you wanna actually like wash this negative out you know like to go to the shower but there is no water you wanna even to have something you know the light to charge your batteries and the laptop and to transfer it but you couldn't because the generator uh, don't have a diesel uh, in your hotel and the the Red Cross, which a friend friend of us and next to us, they were bombed. And you are keeping your battery uh, safe in a safe, you know, like in 
your, because your laptop might have just a little percentage of the battery. If something big happened, you should transfer uh, some important stuff. You downgrade the images, you switch to JPEGs rather than to shoot raw and etc. cetera to, to make you know, your economic and ergonomic uh, of all of that. It's because this is uh, the battery uh, you know, of can to call to the editors and to, to et cetera, et cetera. And, uh, and all of this, you know, like it's all these days, you know, it was a challenge of surviving, surviving uh, and to thinking about what we can do and how we should work and how we should, you know, like grab our together, where we should move next. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, and one of the big issues for you was um, uh, having power and also being able to transmit, right? I mean, and you had a lot of, uh, uh, Vasilisa, you mentioned, um, I think, a police officer named Vladimir who would help find communications for you uh, from time to time. And, but, it, you know, the fact that you were able to cobble something together, how did that work? I mean, that must have, because I, I think, you know, as Mrs. Stavs said early, earlier, um, getting those stories out made you know, told the world something that they would not have known. And, and so, you know, you were there, but getting the word out, how did you cobble that together in a place that, you know, had, had little, little power and little telecom capability? Um, all the time, it was really hard. Because one day, like, I, I remember that connection was okay, and then it was less, less, less. And one day, we woke up from explosions and recognized that there is no connection at all. And, uh, like, first days, we just tried to find the highest spot. Like, we were in the hospital, so we were in, we went to the seventh floor to try to catch this connection, and we find some and then uh, Mrs. Love cut the video for 10 pieces and uh, we uh, put three phones on the window trying to send these uh, videos somehow because we were really scared that we will be not able to send it. And then I remember some days we were without connection at all and uh, it was also the scariest scene because all day it was like really um hard uh, scenes happened and like real tragedy and we really needed to show it to the world to save these people to tell their stories and then yeah we likely meet Vladimir is a policeman from Mariupol who showed us the place in the city it was the last place in the city where you could find connection it was like a mobile provider office and people who knew that they they all tried to come to this place to find some connection just to call their loved ones and say that they are alive. And I remember this feeling being there and heard like people talking to their families saying like, I love you, it's okay, I will survive. And this, this time we sit next to each other sending the videos, photos, and also connecting with the editors, our families and all time it was really dangerous because this place were under shelling of course and uh, airplane was all the time on the sky so and we had this uh, moment in our film 20 days in Mariupol like that showing how it worked but it was really hard and we were scared that we will be not able to send it because it was really really important and we tried to do everything to do it you mentioned editors. Um, I was wondering, uh, the, the three of you, how, how I guess through this cobbled together communications, but how often were you uh, receiving information, getting feedback, getting su support, help from from your editors uh, outside, and and 
how how much was that helpful to you? We had a we had a cell phone, so whenever whenever there was no connection at all, we still could call. But that's that's actually quite a quite a dangerous game because to use a cell phone, you have to stay outside, like on an open space, mm -hmm. good like well open space, for ten minutes to catch the satellites, and then you start calling, and then you know that that signal might attract might attract a strike. So it's a bit of a it's a bit of a a, a game whether you whether you risk and, and, and stay connected at least for, for a few minutes and send very important information and receive important information about possible um, exit routes, about about what is going on with with the whole country, which because that's the question we were asked a lot of with just people we met. You know, they see they see the press sign on your helmet and they think you know everything. It's a very big responsibility. I I might come back to that. So yeah. yeah, that was a that was a hard choice to make. Whether you risk and stay connected, or you don't stay connected and and you just stay a bit safer. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But that being that being said, I think Mariupol is is a is a is a tragic but important case study, uh, a unique case study because we actually saw what is happening to the city, modern city, and modern society. Uh, when it's deprived of of all communications, it's not only it wasn't only besieged by by a military force; it was besieged uh, informationally. So everything was cut off, and everyone everyone was cut off from from everyone. So that led to swift, and when I say swift, it, we're talking days, a few days, a collapse of of the society. Everyone was in panic. Everyone lost their, well, I say not everyone, but a lot of people lost their ability to resist, which is exactly what Russia wanted. That is why the information siege. So we can actually see how, how devastating the absence of any connection could, uh, is, influencing, is influencing the modern society. Sometimes it's more destructive than not having food or water. Mm -hmm. And that is why the work of journalism is why the support to journalism, you know, touches what you do, is so important in in modern in modern conflict zones, because without journalism, uh, everything falls apart. Apparently, I never knew that, but that kind of gave me at least it gave me the inspiration to to uh, to move forward. That's that's really a, a terrifically insightful point and and i believe your stories uh noted that um watching uh people scramble to survive and you know uh things that maybe they normally would not have done that's were... exactly the result of the panic yeah and and lack of information that is there any help coming exactly exactly yeah, yeah. It was, we received so many yeah. comments, you know, from the people, <clears throat> and we said that uh, for the work we did, you know, like that the images, you know, like we sent, uh, there were the people they were waiting for that images to see, because uh, because of course they don't want to see that uh, that you know horrible things, but the world uh, want to see what is going on truly. And uh, we were like, sometimes we heard that we were the eyes of Mariupol at that time because there was so limited of information on the, the people's phones, the QGC materials, and, uh, and us who were transmitted uh, once per two days right. uh, when we had collected some materials. And what was it like? I know, uh, as you could in the midst of your work, you were also um, helping people. Uh, and how did you, you know, I, I think um, it was referred to earlier that, you know, that there's uh, some uh, norms of journalism, of being the objective. Uh, observer that in this situation uh 
it was hard to stick to. And I just wondered, um, did you think about that? Or um, as you were helping people, was it like, it just what, what else would you do? You know that uh, our our mission there were like uh, were to focus uh, on our job. You know, like we we were like in many difficult situations, and all the time there was were people around. And uh, when we were like we needed to help, for example, to medic to help him to uh, to move a patient to the ambulance or any other. Um, to help to move something to cover uh, the destroyed window when you have free and nothing to do and but when there is a lot of situation uh extremely situation where is something ex important is going on you see so many like people like policemen firefighters uh the rescuers volunteers who are there and uh, they are helping and mm -hmm. We thought that our role is not to interact because there is the medics and the policemen know their work much better than us mm -hmm. uh, to provide in help uh, and we can show the world maybe that was our mission as well so that yeah and we showed the facts you know sometimes these images said more than words because you can see everything and of course uh, uh, we are journalists, but also we are people, we are human. And uh, I remember some moments when people really need the support, like when you just can talk to the person here yeah, just to hide because everyone needs this support, just like uh, normal people. And we also need it. And uh, I think it's normal. And it's so important in our work because it's also about uh, the stories are about feelings and uh, about people. It's so important to understand people, to feel this empathy and to support people in the same time because uh, everyone is in really difficult life situation. And I remember it as well, like situation when we're like uh, being in some shelters and people uh, ask us, would you take a photograph of me? That some that my parents will see me, mm -hmm. and they will react. And as well, I received so many uh, comments, like, and the people wrote me in the social media who recognize their relatives, and friends on the photographs, and they say, said like, good, I know that my my son is here, is in a shelter, if they are alive. Mm -hmm. Ask me where they are, and you reply in like short message to the locations. And that's it. Literally, you are the line of communication. Um, can may I ask? I've I have read your uh, stories again, watched uh, the videos, seen the photos more than once. Each time, uh, I'm always just in deep admiration, but also it, it's very harrowing. Very harrowing stories you were telling. And I just wondered, would each of you uh, share with us um, the story that stuck with you, the one you're most proud of, the one, you know, that was the most difficult, however you, you know, the story that if you could say the one story of, of the many you did that stuck with, that meant the most to you. Um, I'd, I'd love it if you would share that. Uh, Mr. Slav, maybe you could start us. Yeah, just before I do, before I do, I want to add something because yes. that is actually very heated conversation right now as unfortunately more and more conflicts are unfolding and more and more wars probably will unfold in the world. The society, political, political establishment and uh, so civil society are, uh, everywhere is very, very polarized, very polarized. And that is somehow an expectation from one side, there is an expectation for journalism to take sides. From another side, there is an expectation for journalists to become even more removed from, uh, from the stories and to be, let's say, absolutely objective, which is, again, uh, a question... Uh, what is absolute objectivity? I think the point is 
uh, that uh, unlike many other conflicts in, in the world right now, which are incredibly complex and uh, historically, culturally uh, expand uh, for, for, for years and, um, and very hard to, to make like a blanket judgment who is right, who is wrong. Uh, for Ukraine, it is a bit easier, uh, I would say, um, because in Ukraine, uh, as Russia uh, invaded Ukraine, it is quite easy to understand who is an attacker, who is the victim. And in this case, even when we are focusing our efforts on coverage of a Ukrainian perspective, that is a focus on coverage, not Ukrainian perspective, but the perspective of people who are suffering from violent attacks. Mm -hmm. We are focusing on the civilians and whether those are Ukrainian civilians or maybe they are, they could be civilians in any other country, our focus would still be there. You can see that our wor work is significantly pr prevails in, in, in the themes of, of covering how war affects civilian population and how unacceptable the war and invasion is so naturally there is no there is no moral um, there is no moral uh, conflict in in this one uh, uh, mm -hmm. we have to tell stories of the civilians who are suffering from unlawful attack as simple as that and, um, and there are so many the word answering your question the, the most difficult stories i think these are uh, stories which we weren't able to tell because we we could we keep hearing people from Mariupol who watch the film who who read the stories we wrote they keep coming to us and they keep telling new new stories that we never knew that yeah. were happening or we knew about them but we weren't able to film them and and those stories are are the most difficult and uh yeah i i think the most frustrating and the most devastating story for me at least was the story that we were not able to tell uh -huh. well, directly it's a story about bombing of mariupol drama theater uh, a lot of women some women who who were who survived the the bombing of maternity hospital moved to drama theater along with with up to a thousand people who were sheltered there and they were bombed from the airplane again and and then we investigated it thoroughly we reconstructed Vasilis did a lot of work Evgeny did a lot of work we, we all were trying to and our partner uh, Laurie Hinnant in Paris who investigated that that case uh, reconstructed in 3D uh, took uh, uh, witness um, statements from dozens of people, and only then we were able to to understand uh, that you know up to five hundred people could die there in two strikes. Like it's it's unimaginable the scale, and there were no journalists there. It was n no one, and right. and that proves again and again how how important it is for journalists to be in a places where human rights are violated, when uh, there are possible war crimes and later investigations needed, and how bad that they're not there. And it happened right after we left. So it was 16th of March. We left on 15th. And it was 16th of March. Horrible. Well, I, I, I certainly, you know, commend you for staying as long as you did but i i can understand why finding out what happened later and you had spent so much time knowing the people there um let me ask you um actually before because our time is unfortunately coming to an end shortly i would like to talk a little bit about um your escape and uh mr slav i think um you were uh, kind of the lead writer on uh, the story of the escape. And I think you you mentioned that the first thing was you had to decide whether the, the Ukrainian troops who came to uh, extract you, help you flee, were actually Ukrainian troops and not Russian. So what, for the three of you, what was that like as you left? 
Shane. Uh, <clears throat> I would I would just say that uh, corrections uh, we were it uh, extracted uh, by Ukrainian armed forces. Uh, they lead us to go out from the district which were surrounded by Russians, uh, and uh, this group of special armed forces help us to move out. Uh, we run away with them, you know, like. Uh, running three blocks under the heavy shelling and then jumped to their cars and they moved us uh, through the front line, you know, in the district. It's, uh, and throw us in the city center and then we walk. <laughs> we lost our car. Uh, and then we realized that uh, we are as well trapped like other civilians. Mm -hmm. And how and what we should do next and how we should operate in the city and how we should work because the wheels is our was our foot at mm -hmm. the time. And that make our life a bit harder. And uh, but we didn't give gave up and we were continue to to work. And um, and later we realize that uh there is a time to leave because we heard that some people uh already crossed uh the front line and you know evacuated to the government side to the British, to Zaporizhia. And mm -hmm. then we was spoke to our editors uh and make a decision that we should try. And Volodymyr, our friend, uh take us with his family, risking his family as well, uh, knew that we are in the list, uh, take us with him. And through the 15 Russian checkpoints, you know, uh, thanks God we you know, were passed through and in the middle of the night, we, uh, we crossed the line. Wow. Wow. And how did it come about that um, you learned of, got to know the um, Ukrainian medic, uh, Tara, is that how you say her name? Tara. Yeah. And, and how, and, and it was quite a, um, taking out her uh, data, her video card was, you know, uh, it, fraught with danger and I you know what if so how did that all come about and and um had you did you know what was on it before you had you view, viewed it before you took it out and Vasily said I think you actually were the carrier yeah like when we were in Mariupol first days we knew that Tyra is working there and uh, because she was well-known medic even before because she was helping people, civilians near the front line areas from 2014s. And we knew that she was in Mariupol, but we, and we really wanted to come to her, to meet, to document in her work, but she was really busy even in the first days. And she told like, sorry, we can't uh, work because I'm busy. And then, like one day, I think some days before we left, like uh, Mr. Slav, he received the card from the policeman because she gives this car and asked to take it out from the city because she understood that she uh, will not leave, but she wanted to save these materials that she had in the card. And I remember that we got this card and we didn't know what is in this card. It was just a tiny card, and we didn't have time now even to see what was inside. And then. The moment when we uh, left Mariupol, I remember like I tried to find uh, like the most safest place for this car to hide it uh, because I could like imagine what it could be inside this cart. And then, yeah, when we left, it was 15 of um, March, uh, Tyra was uh, captured by Russians. And at that moment, we understood 
that we have her card, but we even don't know what is inside, what's happened with her and where is she. Then it was, there were some like, um, I think videos in Russian TV where they told that she is like a Nazi and she is a Azov Battalion medic, but it wasn't true. It wasn't true. And then I remember we spent some days uh, searching through her cards, looking what is inside and we started doing our story about her like because we saw that she saved civilians she saved a lot of children she saved a lot of soldiers and she even saved a lot of russian soldiers because like i remember this dialogue that she had with them like she said like i'm medic i, I will help everyone and then uh, we spoke with her friends with her uh, husband and we did this story even though we were really scared like because there were no information about her for two months and then we published it and likely in two weeks she was released from captivity and I remember first phone call with her she said thank you for this because like information and informational support and whole world helped to make her free again like and now she is free, she is good, she is okay, she is going through the whole world, say, telling her story and her experience, and he, she is now taking care of uh, these um, soldiers, civilians who are still in Russian captivity, because there are thousands of them now in captivity, and there is no information about them, and she working on that to uh, let them come back home as uh, soon as possible. Thank you for sharing that story. And thank you for all of your incredible work. Um, I'm sorry to say, because I would love to hear more about uh, all the things you're doing and, I'm, and what you're doing today, but we have run out of time. And to our audience, I apologize. I didn't get to all of your questions, but uh, Mstislav Evgeny Vasilisa, thank you so much for joining us today and for all of your wonderful work in Ukraine. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you so much, EITP. It's thank really you. big honor for us. It's thank you so much. You're very welcome. And to all of you, goodbye.